Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at the history of the Tor project. So let's delve in and talk about it. I'm, I'm not going to just talk about history. I'm also going to talk about some of the problems they've had. I'm going to talk about some of the things that it does and it does well. And I'm going to talk about some alternatives. So yeah, let's just cover it. And, and uh, so the, the first, some statistics first. 25% of adult internet users have posted sensitive information about themselves on social media platforms. And it isn't just that you're publishing information about yourself, but there's also this social map that these companies uh, build up on you and as to who your friends and your relatives and what their likes and dislikes and the types of things they, they like about you and the things that you're doing that they like, and that helps them sell ads. 67% of internet users worldwide are more concerned with their online privacy than they have ever been. These stats are from this year, from 2023. So yeah, this is pretty recent stuff. 79% of internet users around the world feel that they have completely lost control over their personal information. <laughs> Definitely feel like I'm one of them. Yeah, uh, with all the breaches, and uh, yeah, it's just been insane. Well, let's go back and let's talk about the Tor history and where it evolved from and, and kind of how it started in its being. So the Tor project became a 501c3, uh, that's a nonprofit, in 2006. So in 1995, to be exact, it began at the U.S. Naval Research Labs, or NRL. The project founders were David Goldschlag, Mike Reed, and Paul Cervel, uh, Severson. But what they, were what they were trying to find out was if there was a way to create an internet connection that won't reveal who is talking to whom, even while someone was monitoring the network at the lowest possible level, even at the packet level, to see what was going on. So the answer was they came up with a design and a prototype for something they called the onion router based network. When, a, when you create a message that's the blue, the blue pipe in the middle, the very middle of it, that is either you're, you're call, making a call to a website or you're delivering a packet of data to maybe an, F, an FT, SFTP server or a cloud server or wherever it is. But that is encapsulated with three different layers. And I've talked about this before. You can, if you're interested in more in-depth information on how Tor works, you can go to my, uh, my video I did on Tor. That's as simple as I can make it. There, yes, there's a lot more that goes on, but I'm, we're not going to delve in at this point all that. Again, go look at the other video. What is an onion router anyway? I mean, we've kind of described it a bit, but officially this is the way the NRL described it. So the goal of the onion routing was to have a way to use the internet with as much privacy as possible. And the idea was to route traffic through multiple servers and encrypt it at each step of the way. That's pretty much how it works today. It, yeah, it's as in its simplest way to explain it. The other thing that uh, both Roger and Paul realized was in order for this to be trusted and to be able to get it in the hands to as, as many developers as possible. So they realized right away that the only way they were going to do that was to, uh, to create a free and open source software project. And in 2002, they did exactly that. They released their code as FOSS. The Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation saw that they had did that. They were had an initiative at the time to try to figure out how to make privacy better on the internet. So they started funding the Tor project in 2004. I think they funded it for maybe three or four years, but it may be three years. Um, but they eventually, they have, it, the, the project got to the point where it was, it was qualified as a 503C. There were a lot of other people doing donations, and it wasn't necessary for the EFF to stay in and fund them. And so they sort of, I don't know if they still contribute or not, but they're not listed currently as one of their 
active uh, contributor. There are a lot of people that are, con there's a lot of individuals, there's a lot of companies that are contributing to the project. So it, it, there's definitely a lot of interest in it. The problem with Tor at this point was they were running into issues where if a, if an, if a particular governmental enter, entity or a company threw up a firewall and they put it through a proxy, that basically blocked access to the Tor network. So, so they created up uh, created this thing called the Onion Bridge. So it allowed people to operate a Tor uh, to get to the Tor network from behind corporate firewalls or government firewalls that were put up to block access to the internet. Due to the efforts of Edward Snowden in 2013, when he exposed the extent and depth of data collection by the three-letter agencies, Tor again spiked because all of a sudden people saw you know, how much data was being collected on them. Tor continues, uh, on the Tor project continues to try to make Tor easier to use and to set up. I, been, I used Tor when it was, I think it was still in beta, and I remember that <laughs> it was not easy to set it up because you had to set up all of the routing paths and all that stuff yourself. So you basically had a collection of software. Well, now you don't have to do any of that. It's all automatic. You install the browser, you click the connect, and you're done. It figures out everything else that you need to get from the entry point to the exit point and off to your site. So there are weaknesses in Tor. There's weaknesses in all software. It doesn't matter what it is. So all of a sudden, out of the blue, 115 new network nodes for Tor join the Tor network as relays, and they begin carrying out a new form of identification hack on those users of Tor, and particularly those users of Tor that were accessing the hidden services inside of the Tor network. Yes, there are websites inside of the Tor network. Uh, and those are uh, the dot .onion addresses that if you've used Tor, you may have seen those. There are search engines in there. There's all kinds of stuff in there, good and bad. Uh, July the 4th in 2014, same year, the Tor browser identified a collection of relays that appear to be attempting to de-anonymize users who are engaged or accessing hidden services inside of Tor. Then in July 9th of 2015, Uncharted Software, now they didn't do this to be malicious, they were setting up a map to help them understand the growth of Tor over time because they were doing research on the project. But but this, this scared the, the Tor project because they published the initial source code for their web application called Torflow. And I'll show you a map of it. It's still up. You can go look at it, but it doesn't, it hasn't been collecting new data. It's still got the same data it collected back in 2015. So the Torflow creates an interactive map of the entire Tor network, both all of the entrance nodes, all of the exit nodes, and all of the nodes in between. So you can basically follow a packet all the way through the network. Uh, the other issue is that some say if you use Tor, the NSA will more likely target you. Uh, and after everything that, that Snowden told us about, didn't Snowden prove that they're, they have us all targeted anyways? The other one is that slow, uh, Tor slows down your web browsing experience because of the multiple encrypted hops. That's actually incorrect. The part that is correct is that the web browsing does slow down, but it's not. it doesn't have anything to do with the encrypted hops. Uh, yeah, unencrypting happens pretty fast. Yes, there are three hops in the way that is going to add a little bit of latency as you go through. But the real problem is that there's a data transfer cap inside of the Tor network. I think that's what it's still set to. That's the real culprit. So yeah, there's a data cap there on the transfer speeds. Tor is not a good choice for watching high quality streaming videos. No, it isn't. That's true. Absolutely true. The other one is your data is no longer protected when leading, leaving a Tor exit node. Uh, well, first of all, that I, that's a ridiculous argument because even if you're on a VPN, your data leaves the VPN unprotected unless you took steps to protect it when you sent it through the VPN network. Uh, and if you don't use anything, your data is unprotected going through the internet. So I don't know what, what is that really trying to tell me. The other thing is that you can do to help mitigate that. Most of the websites today are HTTPS. Most of the other traffic goes TLS. So, you know, you, you don't really have a huge problem unless 
you're accessing sites that are totally unencrypted and your browser should be telling you that. But Tor, like any other piece of code, it's software, it, it enjoys all the same weaknesses and vulnerabilities that you can find in any code. Uh, it, yeah, we humans are not real good at, at, at securing our software. So the, the criticisms for Tor architecture is another area, and that has to do with um, some of the things that happen as it flows through the network and reaches the exit nodes. The concern over a particular participant in a relay node, if they had access to both the entrance and the exit node, they could piece together who you are. And that's true, they could. So far from what I have seen, now I haven't reviewed everything that's out there. There are some things that are coming now that look interesting. They look very interesting, in fact. But yeah, yeah, for me, it's the best I have seen so far. Let me say that. What about the software? What is offered today? Well, there's actually two different projects that are going on in the Tor project itself. Of course, the Tor browser has been around a long time. We were at 12.5.1 at the time I'm making this video. That will run on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. There's also Arty. Arty is a, a new Tor client, and that is Rust-based. Uh, they're hoping to get additional performance out of it to try to address some of that performance problem where they can. But right now, Arty is not as robust in the security part at the present time. So, uh, I mean, there, you know how open source works, right? I mean, it's stepwise refinement until you reach the final state of the software. So, and then you have the capabilities that are equivalent to the Tor browser. It took a long time for all those things to get into the Tor browser. It'll probably take some time for Artie to catch up. So right now they're saying, if you want to go evaluate it, play with it, kick the tires, fine, but don't use it in security sensitive workflows, right? Just yet. What is Tor good at? Well, Tor won't reveal the IP address to a visited website. It'll only reveal the exit note. It is FOSS, it's free and open source software. So hopefully that gives the security researchers the ability to not only uncover vulnerabilities and potential places for malware to gain footholds, but also helps them address what part of the code is responsible for that, for that particular vulnerability. They can then communicate that more readily to the developers and hopefully we get a fix faster as a result. So all good things there. It allows um, access to geographically restricted websites and content. In some countries, that could get you arrested. The next piece is it provides encryption as data flows through the Tor network. Once it leaves it, yeah, you, you get whatever you sent in. So that's why I was saying make sure that you're accessing sites that are HTTPS or TLS encrypted. Uh, one of the things that Tor is really good at, and we have seen this, we've seen people try to dismantle the Tor network by brute force, and it's very dis difficult to disrupt it. What about the alternatives? So some of these I have reviewed, some of these I have not. Most of them, in fact, I have not. There's the Epic browser that runs on both Windows and Mac. I, ha I have no, no uh, knowledge of how it works. Uh, but you know, like I said, there's something in here that you would like me to, to go check on and review for you. I'd be happy to do that. Leave me a comment below. I2P looks really interesting. I'm surprised I haven't looked at it till now. It's been around for a while, but they use up to thousands of relay nodes. So trying to trace your way through that would make things really confusing and hard. Freenet um, went away, but it didn't go away. It's just been renamed. It's called Hyphenet. Kom uh, Komodo, uh, and that's Ice Dragon. I have never looked at that one. I've heard of it before, but I've never used it. Uh, Yandex Browser, I have used that on occasion, just haven't done a review of it. Tails, of course, I have done a review. That is essentially built around Tor, but it enables Tor for the entire network. So, uh, Plus, they also add their own spin in order to remove all all transient data that has was created during a session, anything you might have stored, notes, anything between restarts, unless you configure, specifically configure Tails to be persistent. Uh, Subgraph OS, I remember when this came out, it looked awesome, but it looks dead. And in fact, the repos, I believe, are dormant. Um, I haven't seen any activity on those for years. So Waterfox has been around a long time. 
It's just a, a privacy-based version of Firefox. It's been around a long, long time. One that does look interesting to me is SRWare Iron. Uh, that seems to be really active, uh, and, it, and it looks interesting in what the capabilities of it are. Brave, of course, has a Tor mode built in, um, and then there's Vivaldi. I haven't looked at Vivaldi for years. There's also ZeroNet. Don't, don't confuse that with TailScale. It is nothing like TailScale. Finally, there's, uh, there's Shadow Socks, and that is a firewall bypass piece of software. Uh, there's also GNUNet, which is uh, trying to build up something similar in the open source realm to uh, challenge Tor. There's also Yggdrasil, uh, that is in the proof of concept phase, and that is uh, privacy-based software that's based on IPv6 mesh. Uh, and that looks interesting to me. I understand that a lot of people don't trust IPv6. Well, you never trust anything that's new. Uh, and of course, IPv6 is not new. <laughs> it's been around for 20 years. So yeah, it might be new to a lot of us that are using it. With that, I would like to thank uh, my sponsors and also the channel members. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, and for you that got to this part of the video, thank you as well. I sure do appreciate it. That's all I had for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like and subscribe. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.